So thank you, Ragnar. Thank you very much for being here. It's 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 a it's a fantastic event, and I'm very glad to present Valsjärde. And um, I think my my presentation. I, I felt that during the conference that it, it very much ties into what other other presenters has and the discussions before me. And so, so you, you should perhaps see this as a continuation of the ongoing discussion here. Um, I'm. Are you hearing me? Yeah, you hear me. Um, so um, I'm going to, uh, to talk about Valsjärde from uh, um, from a, a number of perspectives. Uh, uh, the normal thing when you talk about boat graves is that you focus your discussion or your presentation about the grave goods and the animals in the graves, and the body if there is a body in the grave or not, and so on. But this is uh, in, in this time I, I'd like to talk about the superstructure. Of, of the Valsjärde boats. Oh, that means the roofs, how, how have they been filled in, the cairns, mounds. In some degree, the, the, the disposition of the grave goods in the grave and raise the question, can you use Valsjärde as a model for it understanding the Salma boat burials or not? So I will not present any definite definite answers um, far from that, but maybe some f uh, food for thoughts. So uh, the focus here is Middle Sweden, uh, which means the counties uh, north, particularly the counties north of uh, Lake Mälaren, north of Stockholm. Uh, in this area, we have found uh, archaeologists have found quite a, a couple of boat burial sites through throughout the century, uh, through, since the earliest was found in 1854 in Ultuna, and since then has more than 10 sites been found. Uh, I'd like to start to talk about how well preserved they are. And actually, very few of these places have, are well preserved. Um, uh, that goes especially for the superstructures, the mound, cairns, the visible parts above the ground surface from the graves. Um, I've listed the, the sites with the damaged superstructures on the upper row. Whoops. The red one goes back. Goes back. I really press it really hard. So, um, and the ones up here. And uh, you can also, it, and in all these cases, there are really no documented superstructures of the graves, or the re you can find the remains of the superstructures has fallen into the grave chamber. And the same goes for the preservation conditions for the actual graves. In, for example, Vendel that we have here, we have uh, 14 uh, boat and chamber burials. As far as I don't remember exactly, but uh, but out of five, uh, seven Vendel period boat burials, only one is intact. The other ones are plundered or disturbed yeah, ever since the medieval period and into the 19th century. And that goes for the majority of the graves in middle Sweden. And one might ask why? And uh, the reasons behind this vary a lot. In Vendel, it, it is quite simple. They extended the, the cemetery for the medieval church, and in that way, they damaged many of the graves. Uh, Tune in Alsike, which lies about 20 kilometers south of Uppsala, is a very good example of, of these sites, uh, because in the late Iron Age, the boat graves, the cemeteries in general and the boat grave cemeteries were located very close to the standing farms. So the practice in middle Sweden was that you had, the, you had your Viking farm and just a few meters away, could be only a five, 10 meters, sometimes 100 meters, 150 meters, there was the cemetery. So it was very close. And there is a tendency that the same place that was inhabited uh, um, with the farms in the Viking Age, that was the same place where people were living in the Middle Ages. So that means through the centuries you have a slow but steady 
disturbance of the burial grounds that have been heavily damaged. And in Tuna in Alsiki here, perhaps you can say that the, it is written in German, Acker, which means that it has been ploughed. Especially in the 19th century, you know, when people are migrating to America, we have a population explosion in, uh, in many parts of Europe. Many grave fields are, are damaged. So, to, in Tuna in Alsiki, the graves, some are plundered, some are damaged by uh, ploughing. And, and so there, is, there, there are no superstructures preserved. So in all in the middle Sweden, north of Stockholm, as far as I know, we only have two known sites where the graves are fairly intact, or at least not heavily damaged. To the, to the left, you have Nusha in Köping, I think it's internationally uh, more or less unknown. But you can perhaps see the small depressions in the ground surrounded by small walls. In many of these cases, the lighter picture is unfortunately not very good. Um, they, only two graves have been excavated, one boat grave and one chamber grave that were fairly intact, which proves that it actually is a boat burial ground. On the right-hand side, we have Valsjärde, which is uh, where all the boat graves, some of the boat graves are slightly damaged, but mo more or less intact, all, all of them. Uh, the first one was found here, number one. A farmer was digging gravel uh, for, for, uh, for the road, probably, and a horse cranium fell out of the gravel pit with a bit in its mouth. And he was one of the few farmers who reported his finds. So if he had not done that, this hill would have been dug away in gravel digging like 95% of the other hills around Uppsala. So it's a very heavily damaged area. And one could also say that Valsjade is lies in the margin of the medieval settlement. This was not close. Uh, the farm here was founded in the 1500s. It was a small and poor farm. So that's one of the reasons why Valsjade is preserved. Uh, the yellow area are the Viking area for the Viking Age boat graves. The blue areas are the Vendel period boat graves. And you can see there is a small difference. Hope you can see that, that the blue ones tend to look more like mounds than the yellow ones. So there's more of a tendency of, of mound burials in the Vendel period, or at least higher superstructures, more distinct superstructures than the Viking Age burials. Um, here is a picture from 1932, I think. Um, by this, the Uppsala University had excavated four Viking Age boat burials, and they went to the other hill and was going to start excavating Valsjärde V, the first of the Vendel period ones. So you see, this, uh, you see the numbers of the uh, graves, number six, seven, and five. Student stands on five. And we say there are mounts, but if you see them, they, they are quite pathetic mounds. They are, they are quite low, there is a big depression in them. But actually, if you take the, take the measurements, they are si about 16 meters long and 8 meters wide. So it is, as a, as a constructions, they are, they are quite substantial. Here you have the, uh, a picture from the excavation. You can see the students are, are excavating in their student, white student caps and costumes, uh, nicely dressed. Uh, how, in these days, they were not very interested in the stratigraphy. It is described that they made two test pits, one where they assumed the, the, uh, the front prow of the bow wa boat was. They dug that, found the rivets and some animals. Then they could calculate where they thought the chamber was. And then they went right down for the chamber. So they have excavated the extension of the shape of the boat and its contents. They were not very interested in, in the actual mounds. 
But that, that changed a little bit later when, when they learned more and more about this symmetry. So when we reached the late 1940s and first years of 1950s, they, they, they do some very nice uh, documentation of the, of the mound constructions. So I, I will focus on two graves, uh, Balsia de Five, uh, two um, up here, and Balsia de Thirteen. Uh, I, I've also marked out in brown some older graves that I think are a good, are a good il illustration. These are the ancestors of the migration period ancestors of the, of the boat grave persons, actually buried on the most prominent position of the hill. And they are never touched by Vendel and Viking period uh, uh, boat graves, so they are, they are revered as ancestors in some way, they're respected. Uh, very interesting. Wooden constructions from boat graves or chamber graves are very rarely preserved. Uh, this grave, I think, the number, it's Balsia de 21, I think, um, was heavily plundered. You can see the plundering hole here in the cairn. Uh, there was an earth, earth layer above the cairn, then came the cairn. They could, you could see, this, see the plundering hole. When they meet, went, took away the cairn, you could see the chopped away plundering hole here. And they could document that the chamber had, had a, once had a roof consisting of two layers of wooden beams or planks. Um, that fortunately when it rotted it became soft and smoothly settled into the bottom of the chamber and they, there they found a roof. Um, and that has importance for later burials as well, I think. Uh, first, a little bit about the furnishing of the graves. Um, this is an 11th century burial from Tuna in Alsike, uh, which it is not a boat grave, it is a chamber burial, but it illustrates roughly the deposition of the grave goods that you can see from the late 7th century, 6th century to into the 11th century in Middle Sweden. Whoops. Push hard. And um, so you have, you have the area where the human body is positioned, surrounded by his personal, uh, personal objects and weapons. It can be swords, shields, um, combs, yeah, various personal stuff. In front of his feet, you often find some vessels, wooden vessels. Uh, like in the most uh, richest uh, boat graves, it's, it's a full set of uh, plates and bowls and beakers made of wood. Could be six or seven, eight different wooden wood vessels. Further towards the feet, you have the, the riding gear, bridles, and later on the stirrups and spurs. Uh, and furthest to the left in this case, you have the deposited animals together with cooking equipment and other tools that are not so personal for the deceased. So here we have Valsia de 5 and Valsia de 13. Um, you, see the, you see the rivets of the boat, just like in Salme. Uh, this area is in general quite empty. You have the chamber. A part where one, two, three shields. Uh, the person is buried with two swords here, a third one here, a glass speaker. Uh, in front of his feet, he has the riding gear, uh, the cooking uh, uh, wooden plates, another utensil. The helmet is here, unusual position. Normally, they are up here. And then you have loads of animals here together with an iron cauldron, an iron chain for the cauldron, uh, etc. Um, the 13 is here. This one is dated about 100 years later, from about 750, perhaps a few decades ahead, which means it's more 
it's closer to Salme graves in, in dating. Uh, you have the chamber here, riding gear, lots of arrowheads, actually two sets of arrowheads in this grave. Seems to be both combat arrows and hunting arrows, some are very broad bladed. Uh, someone should really analyze the arrowheads here and compare them with Salme because the Salme arrowheads confuses me chronologically. <laughs> and then you have lots of the small animals up here. Here you have the, the sheep, uh, the pigs, fishes, birds, and outside the boat in both Valsjade 13 and Valsjade 5, that's where you have the leisure animals. Uh, or the, you have the horses and the dogs, they are lying outside the boat. Um, Valsjade 13 is missing the helmet. And that is something to think about for uh, for uh, for Salme as well. Um, I, I talked about contents of graves very briefly, but I will move ahead now towards the superstructures. And as as I said before, Valsjade Five is not very well documented, but Valsjade Thirteen was one of the last, the second last boat grave or third from last excavated in Valsjade, so they had learned a lot. Um, on the contour lines, it is damaged here by a gravel pit in some degree, so the, the mound is not complete. Um, but you can see, the, so in some degree, the, the extension of the mounds on, uh, on basis of the contour lines. It's these things here. I think this is what they interpreted as the pit dug. For the, for the boat, the, small, the light brown, reddish color. And here is the actual boat. And as you can see, it also has been covered by a cairn. Mm. It, you see, you don't see as much stones in the middle, but that, I think that is because that's the deepest part of the boat. So when they document the cairn, more stone has fallen in to the boat chamber in that, in that location. So that's why they haven't drawn in the stones in the same degree. I will show you later on. And as you can see here from the profile, it's very interesting. You see remains of the cairn. You can see how the stones have fallen into the chamber. You can see everything has fallen into some kind of hollow space. Yes. In Valsjade 5, uh, that we are working with right now, we had some headaches trying to understand the stratigraphy of the grave because they, they only draw prof two or three pro two profiles of the grave and they were made in the margins of the boat. So it's, it's, it's kind of tricky. But you can see on, to understand the stratigraphy, but you can see where these two smiling students are that the entire chamber seems to be filled with stones for going right way to the bottom of the grave. Uh, how, how it was in the, in the other parts of the grave, uh, we don't know. But as you can see on the left hand picture, there are, there are a lot of stones that has been pulled out from, from the trench. Um, the upper part here shows again the, the plan of the Valsjade, of Valsjade 5. The red dots uh, ties into what Neil talked about yesterday and with the arrowheads that had, has come up during the presentation. Um, these, the, every, the red dots are, are the location of the arrowheads in Valsjade 5. Um, I'm going off topic now, but the concentration of arrowheads is here. Then you find single arrowheads around the boat. Or, and in, in at least one case, the arrowhead has been measured in on a depth below the boat rivets. So there is a possibility that it has been shot into the boat and the, the point of the arrowhead has been stuck underneath the board planks of the boat. But anyway, after the off topic, here's a pro profile. The profile that is shown below is uh, approximately where this red, uh, red line is. Uh, 
you see on this profile how the stones have fallen into the boat. Some of the stones I've marked, it, some of the stones with, with yellow arrows. Uh, the bovine skeleton, the cow skeleton that is cut by the profile is here. And in this reddish area, you find the rivets of the boat. So the rivets are found very deep in the boat trench. And as you can see, they're drawn in loads of different layers here that are very hard to understand for us. But we, we can, but on basis of other great mounds that I've excavated or studied in Gamla Uppsala and other places, um, the mound can, a mound can consist of several layers. You can, have, you can put a turf layer above the cairn. You can put a, lot, a, a, a layer of solid clay over a cairn and then put earth layers on top of it. So it's different sequences of earth that can be put over a cairn for a boat. Uh, talking about the wooden constructions, you saw the, the chamber burial earlier with, with a very clear wooden roof. Uh, this is harder for several of the boat burials, partly because um, Partly because of preservation conditions, because it's loose gravel. So it's not perfect conditions for a collapsed wooden roof. Um, but uh, in Valsia the Six, unfortunately, I don't have a good picture of it. They had the, they had the remains of lying beams just underneath the cairn. In Valsia 13, you also have some remains of what seems to be parts of the roof lying here. Uh, not much, but it seems to be the roof. Uh, we also have some very big spirals uh, attached to the boat. Here they are. One here, one here. Um, they are found very high up in the stratigraphy, so they seem to be... There is some wooden construction associated with iron spirals related to the boat as well. So... Uh, now to the delicate part of, of <laughs> discussing Salm in, in relation to the Valsia, the boat burials. And um, so the question is, are the, the strontium analysis indicate that many or some come from the Swedish mainland, uh, could be middle Sweden, Uppsala region. Uh, so in that case, they, they are influenced from practices from the homeland, but how? And you also, I, I, I also think that we should, this is like Taunton and other mass burials, it's, you have to be situation adapted when you're away from home. You have to improvise because you can't do like you're doing at home, especially when loads of people have died and you have to respect them in, collectively in some way. So you, you really can't do as you do on a family burial ground. Um, one thing that I find partic uh, confusing with uh, Salme II in comparison with, with my experience from the Valsia de Boat Burials, it is that, um, I think you may very well correct me because we, I, we have, I have not seen all the documents or studied all the boat plans and so on. But the, it is peculiar that we are missing the rows of rivets. It indicates damage. You see it here, you see it here, here, and here. So some parts of the boats seems to be gone. Something you also see on several of the boat graves in Valsjade that are just eight to nine meters long so they're very much smaller than the Salme II boat. Um, but you still, that, and the Salme boat has contained many, many more rivets than the, than the Valsjade boats. It's much bigger. But still, you have, in several of the Valsjade boat graves, you have these rivets from outside the lines of, of the board plank, the rivets representing the board planks. And th this represents the prows of the boat, and when they rot, the, the rivets falls aside. When you have rivets on, on the lower ground, 
they are connected, they are closer to the bottom of the trench, so maybe the boat falls out a little bit, but it's not that much as a prow that goes up a bit. And I, 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 there is surprisingly little rivets, both in this end and in this end, uh, this disturbed pattern of a couple of rivets. And when we look at uh, we can't really compare Summit 2 with the Valsia de Boats in that way, that it has been much bigger. But if we consider the pictures of the sailing ships that we see, the Kukstad and Oseberg ship below, and the, and the uh, Gotlandic picture stones above, they have very high prows, which makes Summit 2 uh, confusing for me. So that according to picture evidence and later boats, there should be quite high prows. So at least as a food for thought, that, that has come up repeatedly in, the, in our excursion two days ago, in the discussions and so on. Were the superstructures in, in Salome, how damaged has the place been? And we know it has been damaged by, by the tarmac and the school and the bulldozing and so on. Um, so, I would not suggest, but at least a hypothesis, that maybe this red line represents where a potential Salma boat or both Salma boat has been cut off, simply that we're missing the upper parts of the prow on each side, and maybe even board planks on on each side. For example, the Gugstad ship, it's 23 meters long, and I think I, I counted it last night, and I think that it had 12 board planks. Instead of, I think Salma has six or something like that, that you can count, perhaps seven, if you, if you count where the rivets, uh, the, the rivet rows. You may correct me, Yuri, on that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, five or six. But it all depends on how big the boards were. Because, for example, the Valsia, the third boat, uh, 13 boat is made of pine. And the board plank is probably like this. In some cases, the board planks can be like that and made of oak. So it all depends. And the final picture. Maybe we should not only look at Middle Sweden for parallels to Salme. And this is a place that Torin Sakerson was the latest to write about. Unfortunately, I, have, I can give you the reference if you ask me. In the 1930s, they, were, they, they dug away a large cairn on the west side of this fantastic natural harbor located on the northern tip of Öland. Here is the place, Naberör. Here is Salme. Uh, it is a mass burial, six or seven individuals uh, from the same time, approximately the same time as Valsjärde. It is the only known grave from this side, but if you look on the other side of the bay, we have loads of medieval fortifications and a very peculiar long wall that are not dated as far as I know, probably late medieval. You have big cairns with big holes in them and on a ridge, you have peculiar formations like this that looks at least somewhat like the Valsjärd boat burials. So this is the perfect harbor that has continued into the late Middle Ages. So why not being a very good harbor in the Vendel period for doing raiding and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, you also receive a gift, yep. which may or may not be a board game. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, um, would have uh, time for uh, one question at this point. And um, yes, uh, Alar has uh, raised his hand. Um, I, uh, we noticed uh, also the question uh, from the workshop uh, environment. We will address it later on when uh, Yuri will uh, comment the um, textiles uh,
from uh, the boat in connection with the sails. Yeah. Thanks, John, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question about the orientation of the boats. Uh, in Valskia, the, the, the orientation was quite uh, similar to the, to the Salme. So it's a, a northeast, uh, southwest orientation. And, uh, and for example, in, in, in Salme case, the, the bo both burials are in the, in the spit deposit. It is orientated in uh, uh, north-south. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems that uh, at it, it, it makes, uh, takes uh, uh, a special effort to, 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 to put uh, the boats, but because it's, it doesn't follow the, the, the natural landscape. So it's a, a special effort to put uh, in this north, uh, north uh, east, southwest uh, orientation to the boat. Is, is some, mm. some sort of a tradition there, or what, what is that? No, when I, when you look at you know, the orientation of the boat graves in, in general, it, it doesn't seem to be a rule, like in Christian, northeast, uh, north, yeah, east, west, or, or whatever, or whether it's Christian or Muslim practice or whatever it is. So there's no real rule. So they seem to be, it's, it seems to be family traditions or they adapt to the, to the local topography. Um, so I don't think we should look for rules. And for example, in Valsjärd, I think they, they, cut them, they cut into the ridge and the boat seems to face the river that goes west of the area. The river is just 100 meters away. So it, it has been a very nice, impressive sight if you sail by and you can see them lying in a row like that. If you had placed them along the ridge, you wouldn't have seen them in the same way. So I think it's, it's a matter of display and adaption to the topography and so on. Thank you. Mm -hmm.